Hi everybody, welcome to this webinar, which is the last in the current series for our World After COVID project. The project will, however, be ongoing in the fall, or perhaps even a little during August. All the webinars in this project and a number of, the, of other related materials have been archived and made available to the public at our online resource center, which I urge you to visit. This is the URL you can go to. You may want to jot down that URL. Anyway, at the resource center, you can see the lively conversations I held on our rapidly shifting global balance with people like Medea Benjamin, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, Vijay Prashad, Richard Falk, and more. Today's webinar is sort of a culmination of this part of the ongoing project, and I'm delighted to have two guests today. We'll be welcoming back Professor Richard Falk and welcoming for the first time the distinguished German diplomat and thinker, Hans Christoph von Sponek. Richard, it's great to have you back. You have been an inspiration to this whole project. I'm happy to be with you again, Helena. Thank <laughs> and, you. Helena. Hans, it is really my pleasure to reconnect with you after so many years and to welcome you to our webinar series. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you. Richard Falk, as you viewers may know, is a much valued member of our board here at Just World Educational. You can find a short version of his resume and also of Hans von Sponex at our resource center. And my colleague, Charlotte Cates, is also sharing those resumes in the chat box for today's webinar. You may want to keep your chat box open as Charlotte will be sharing other useful online resources in the chat box throughout today's webinar. She will be closely monitoring the chat box on Zoom and the comments section on our Facebook page. So if you have questions that you want to put to our distinguished guests today, the best way to do that is to type them into the chat box or the comments section on Facebook. So today, in light of the rapid decline in the United States global power and influence that we're currently witnessing, we're going to look at some key aspects of the way the world has worked for the past 75 years under designs that Washington put in place back in 1945. We're going to look at what is changing now and what we should be working towards, broadly speaking, over the years ahead. We'll be looking at issues of UN reform and the needs to overhaul and democratize many of the existing global institutions. We realize we won't resolve any of these issues in the 40 minutes or so that we'll be talking before we open up the space to your questions. But we do hope that what we achieve today will open or reopen these much needed conversations about global governance. And we hope that come fall, we can push those conversations ahead considerably more. So now, a very easy question for our guests, and either one of you can take it first. What is the United Nations good for? Hans, I think you start us off. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think uh, th there are many, many answers to that. And I often remind uh, uh, people with whom uh, the subject of the UN is discussed, um, that we have to define what UN we are referring to. There is the political UN, most uh, prominently in the news, the, Pol the Security Council, the General Assembly, but there is this other, other UN, and that is the UN world of UNICEF, of UNESCO, of UNDP, of WHO, all these operational agencies. And to uh, judge that UN, uh, you have to be very clear which UN you are referring to. And uh, um, I obviously want to make a case for the operational UN that is known sometimes much better in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia, uh, because it operates in the villages, it operates in outlying areas, it tries to bring health, better education, 
um, simply all that which we know about the sustainable development goals that we often discuss. And then there is another world, I would call it the grim world of difference to the world I just referred to, and that is the Security Council and the General Assembly, and particularly the Security Council, which is, according to the UN Charter, the, the, the body that dictates the policy for the UN as a whole. And I think we need to spend a bit of time uh, to understand that political UN uh, more. Maybe Richard can uh, follow this from what I just uh, outlined. Uh, yes, I can uh, add a point about the degree to which the uh, political UN, as Hans has uh, depicted it, uh, was always intended to be subordinate to uh, geopolitical maneuvers of the five permanent members of the Security Council that have, by constitutional right, the power of asserting a veto on any decision by the Security Council, which in effect is saying the five most powerful countries in the world, the five countries that first acquired uh, nuclear weapons, have a uh, exemption from international law and UN obligations whenever they choose to exercise it. And this was designed into the, it's not the failure of the UN, it's the failure of the architects that created the UN, who were worried that these big actors, big political actors, would do what they did to the League of Nations, after war, which was created after World War I, and not participate unless they could keep their discretionary relationship to world politics. And that's always inhibited uh, the UN of the Charter, which has these idealistic goals and purposes set forth and sort of secretly ignores uh, this uh, enormous uh, gap in its authority structure. Yeah, well, we actually last week um, got to hear quite a lot from Marjorie Cohen about impunity and in particular the impunity of the United States under the current system. So I urge people if they didn't see Marjorie's webinar last week to go and see that. And I also want to just note that um, our two guests today, Hans von Sponek and Richard Falk, are currently working on a book on the United Nations system. So um, we'll, we'll wait for the book to come out and have you come back and, and talk about that. But in the meantime, my question is, um, and maybe I'll send it to you first, Richard, this time, can the United Nations help with the intertwined current crises of the pandemic, the economic collapse, and the crisis of global trust and legitimacy? Where is the United Nations? What can it do? Well, I, I think the United Nations in this kind of situation is no better or worse than the behavior of its dominant political actors. And if the United States was behaving properly, as the other four permanent members are, it would be the core of a global cooperative approach uh, to the COVID uh, challenge. And that would make a huge difference, both in terms of uh, containing this pandemic, but also in creating a sense uh, that the leadership of the world has the interests of humanity at least partially at uh, is partially committed to something beyond a narrow and often uh, a greedy sense of national interests and I, I would just add one little point about the overall uh, effect of the UN on, on the world. A Mexican delegate at San Francisco 
was asked what he thought about the UN. At, at the founding of the United Nations. At the founding was, of the yes, UN, in 1945. back in 1945, yes. And he said, it, it holds the mice accountable, but lets the tigers roam free. <laughs> and that's really the essence of what I think we've been trying to uh, mention. That, and, and what Hans said is extremely important because it's, in addition, uh, aside from having the tigers roam free, the operational UN, as he uh, described it, for most of the countries in the world. And that's something that the public doesn't really understand or appreciate. So um, Hans had actually sent some really handy um, visuals, and I want to share another one um, that he uh, sent, which, uh, you know, here in the United States, a lot of people think that the US is paying way too much um, in, of the um, UN's budget. So here's what Hans had pulled together, and um, this is done in the, in the European way down there at the bottom, where it tells you that Bhutan is paying 0 0.087 of its uh, budget to the UN. Well, uh, I, 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 I would just say, uh, Helena, the, the important message in that particular graph is the fact that uh, it is not uh, the US, it is not Europe, in this case Germany, that uh, does anything that would allow the word sacrificing, financing the United Nations, but it is a small, largely, widely unknown country called Bhutan in the Himalayas, of uh, Central Asia uh, that on a per capita basis pays more than uh, the, the others, the, the, the industrialized countries. I hope that John Bolton will see that chart because he's the one who kept reminding the world of the immense sacrifices uh, that the US government, I say US government, I have been a student in America I know how generous America is, how generous people are in interacting with the outside world. But Mr. Bolton was so off um, that it upset me, and this is why I tried to put this chart together, uh, to show how minuscule the contribution uh, to this regular budget of the UN is. And let me add one more thing here, and that is uh, small it may be, but if you add it all together, what comes out as a total annual budget for the last many years, it hasn't changed, is 2.6 .6 billion uh, US dollars. Now take 2.6, and then <laughs> I, I looked at what the budget of the New York Police Department is, and I found out that the Police Department of New York City, where the UN is headquartered, is three times the budget that the Secretary General has available uh, for 193 member countries. So the peanut is given by the, by the industrialized countries, particularly the US, I must single out here, uh, and it's a peanut budget uh, overall that the Secretary General has to deal with all these multifarious uh, problems that arise every day. That's a great, That's a great point. point, and you know, you know here in the United States, States with the Black, Li Black Lives Matter movement, there's a, a move to defund the police, maybe part of the uh, New York City police budget should be sent to the UN instead. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good um, luck. So, so more about the, uh, the UN. Um, We've talked here on the webinar series in previous sessions about the growing power of, of China and the declining power of the United States. And we discussed what's called the Thucydides trap, which is something that was identified by Thucydides, I guess, 2,500 years ago or whatever, when you have a rising power and a, and a fading power and the transition isn't always, um, well, it can often be very perilous. So. Um, 
can the United Nations actually help midwife this transition? Um, maybe we'll send this to, back to you first, Hans, and then... then well, I, I would say uh, the, the, the drama is that we are going at this very moment through a, uh, a trend of polarization. Uh, you have a Western world, by the way, 8% of the global population is West. It's a small, small percentage. And we have uh, a uh, continued demand by one government uh, that the leadership should be unilateral, that there should be exceptionalism in decision making in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the chambers of the United Nations. Um, and that is opposed to a very dramatic geopolitical shift towards another part of the world. So we have on the one side um, a, a, an insistent that the West must play the first violin, and on the other side you have a very distinct evidence, we can see it every day, of Easternization. Um, and I mean by that, of course, first and foremost China, but not only China. There's South Korea, there are other successful uh, Asian nations that uh, are becoming increasingly participatory in political uh, global decision making. So um, that points to clash, lots of opportunity for clash. And that means that this whole idea of the overdue need, the urgency of a reformed United Nations um, is a, a very complicated subject to deal with at the moment. Richard, uh, what, what do you think about um, the ability of the United Nations to midwife this transition? Uh, I, I think it's not very uh, plausible to expect the UN to do very much because here you have the two dominant uh, states at the moment and each of them is very sovereignty oriented and even without the veto, very unwilling to entrust its uh, vital aspects of its policy to an, any external political actor. And one thing that's really important is that when we think of a new Cold War, we should uh, realize that China is not like the Soviet Union. China has risen to ascendancy through soft power instruments of expansion and growth, and is basically uh, exerted, projected its influence in win-win forms, where it builds roads and railroads and does other things, whereas the U.S. is continuing to be a militarist, hard power uh, actor that relies on a network of uh, military bases and navies in every ocean, a militarization of space. So you have now a, a, a tension between two very different forms of power. And it's something new in world history, as far as I know. And the thing, the only other thing I would say is there are two points of tension that could produce a terrible escalation toward war. The first is the fact that China now is at the technological frontier. It's no longer just the factory of the world. It's also the source of uh, technological innovation that used to be one of the American uh, claims to its preeminence. And the second thing is China is trying to establish its regional authority, which collides with the global state pretensions of the United States. So there are lots of friction in the South China Seas and the East Asian uh, waters that could produce the kind of violent incident that quickly might escalate to war. 
And I see those two arenas as extremely dangerous in this period where uh, the, and I've tried to say that it's not really so much a Thucydides trap as a Clausewitz trap, that the real danger is the Western realization that it's in relative decline compared to what Hans referred to in terms of Easternization. And the only instrument that it has to uh, overcome this feeling that it's losing ground to the East is its military power. And therefore, uh, one does have a very frightening geopolitical scenario unfolding at the present time. Well, of course, Clausewitz, the most uh, memorable thing that he said is that war is an extension of politics by other means, which I always under, understood to mean that what is actually important is not what happens on a battlefield, it's the political outcome afterwards. Um, yeah. and, and therefore, we may now be seeing a, an era in which this massively bloated military machine that we have been dis discussing, you know, where you have US bases in 80 or more countries and you have alliances that lock it into military lockstep or anyway, close coordination with countries like Saudi Arabia and, and whatever. All of that may be for nothing. What do you think about that, Hans? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, um, unfortunately, the, uh, the number of uh, bases the U.S. maintains abroad is 10 times more. I mean, we are now having about 800 bases that are around the world uh, trying to pursue uh, very narrow uh, national interests, uh, forgetting that there are another 192 countries. I would argue and say um, I agree with Richard, there is a, a grave danger of confrontation. The West and Europe must try to impress that on its ally in Washington. The West must introduce two words in, into its political and diplomatic dictionary. And one is compromise and the other one is convergence. If we want to have it our way in and out every year, we will march on that road of confrontation. And the Chinese are much more disciplined, are much better organized. Uh, they have the advantage of having a capitalist structure uh, in, in, a in, in a communist uh, philosophical, ideological environment, and that gives them advantages. We have to meet. It's no good that we shun each other. It is no good. And here is a, a newly researched um, awareness that I have that I want to just briefly mention. And that is, I didn't realize that the United States voting behavior in the General Assembly, I would classify the US as the no nation, because the US is continuously and consistently over the years, the one party, often the only party, that votes in the General Assembly against something which is reasonable, which has to do with peace, it has to do with social progress, it has to do with development cooperation. And it is tragic that this country that was so instrumental in creating the United Nations has become an enemy of the United Nations. And if you look at the voting and you see who votes for what, it is very often so clear that there is, on the one hand, the South, the developing countries that look to the OECD, the wealthier countries for help, that vote for something that the, the Operation of the United Nations is absolutely uh, in agreement with, and that to do things that bring forward the sustainable development goals and other good things we have identified. And on the other is this desperate attempt, I, do, I don't want to sound cynical when I say of a dinosaur uh, that is barely still alive, that kicks and tries to prevent the inevitable. So Hans, I mean, I'm delighted to have you on right now. 
let's say you represent all of Europe <laughs> on, our, no. on our webinar series. No, but there, are, there is a serious question about the role of Europe because for 450 years, it was essentially the gang of white European governments that ruled over and looted from all the rest of the world. And, you know, I grew up in Britain and Britain was actually a lot more responsible for that than Germany. So, you know, we, we don't need to uh, go into that perhaps. But then in 1945, Europe got reinvented as a beacon of civilization, uniquely able to rein in the more brash power of the United States. And it was also an inspiration to many in terms of the ability of France and Germany finally to get over their rivalries and build something bigger than themselves. But how about now? I mean, Europe is not in a great shape right now, either, you know, from the pandemic point of view, from the um, economic point of view, or the political point of view. What role can Europe play? Well, the question is, does Europe want to play a role? And the answer is, yes, it does want to play a role. But at the moment, we are very heavily preoccupied with our internal problems. You see, we, we have right now, if you follow the uh, discussion about a European uh, COVID-19 response to uh, the, the uh, economies, uh, the, so, the social systems of the EU member states, and you, can, you, you could see the confrontation, the conflict within the European Union. You have Hungary, you have Poland, you have Czech, totally different approach, uh, clash with uh, the Western European EU member countries. So there are a lot of difficulties that unfortunately chain us right now to an internal dialogue rather than what we should be doing, play a, um, a bridge maker, a uh, facilitating role between uh, the East, China in particular, and uh, the West, the US in particular, and our politicians have said that's, that's a role they would like to play, but they haven't allocated the time to actually do that. Interesting. Richard, do you have uh, something to say about the, the, the role you see Europe as being able to play? Well, uh, I would just say, uh, sort of reflecting back on the prior question, uh, that if in the clash between the Soviet Union and the West, Europe was the center of the, the central game. The mm -hmm. central game was the control of, and after the uh, end of that Cold War, Europe lost its geopolitical relevance and the attention shifted initially to the Middle East and oil and energy and nuclear proliferation in Israel. Uh, and, and now with this new emergent geopolitical confrontation, uh, Europe is searching, I think, for its own geopolitical identity. And of course, it's searching at a time, as Hans points out very clearly, where it's uh, facing its own regional crisis, uh, crisis of confidence, cri uh, crisis of convergence in his terminology, and therefore uh, it would take some, the emergence of some exceptional leadership in Europe to enable it to do what it could do, which is to play this kind of role and maybe through the uh, influence it could bring to bear at the UN, maybe change the whole international atmosphere in a more constructive direction, particularly if we find a way to get rid of Trump and Trumpism <laughs> in November. <laughs> so um, one thing that we heard from Vijay Prashad earlier in the um, webinar series, and I think we heard it from uh, Hilal Elver more recently as well, was the need to um, actually use the financial heft that the West has in order to 
do some important things. Number one, to end punitive sanctions against countries that have been suffering in the case of Cuba for what, 70 years now, but in, in many cases for, for many decades. And then to enact major debt forgiveness. I want to share another um, chart, one actually from a book that I published um, in 2008 which just shows, I mean, this is, as I say, a little bit old because it's from 2008 and it shows the voting power in the World Bank on the inner ring and the IMF on the outer ring in terms of percentage of votes. So basically from kind of 12 o'clock to five o'clock is your rich European countries, Canada and Australia. And then down there around six o'clock, it's the United States and then the white portions are Japan, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. And then that little portion from like eight o'clock to 12 o'clock is 150 other countries in the world, you know? So they really don't have much say. Um, ah, but, but, but wait a minute. That's, that is unfortunately because uh, mainly the US, but the Western group is absolutely unwilling to change the voting strength of the Bretton Woods institutions. That's the tragedy. You know, the Saudi Arabia, or other countries that have money could have easily changed the voting pattern. But if there is a colonial element in the UN system, it's the Bretton Woods institution. No doubt about it. You know, that hasn't changed. The US insists 51% of the voting must be in the hands of the Western group. And as long as that is so, the chart that you show, which is a good chart to see, uh, reflects colonialism. <laughs> so maybe it's time to, to overhaul the system. How, what can we do to do that? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very happy that you, you asked that question because I believe that the chances for a reform of the United Nations will come eventually not from the political side, but from civil society. Civil society over the years has shown that it can play an increasingly important role. It isn't there where it should be yet. Uh, it should be involved in uh, discussions in the Security Council, in the General Assembly. That is happening practically not at all. But the, f the trend, if you ask me, is there a silver lining somewhere? I would say it is uh, with regard to participation of non-governmental organizations of citizens. Let's not forget the charter starts, we the peoples. It doesn't say we the governments, we the peoples. So let us, we the peoples, have a greater share in uh, the dialogue about the future of our planet. Um, Richard, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think uh, there's a good uh, second uh, distinction. Uh, Hans made the distinction between the political UN and operational UN. We also should make a distinction, I think, between the visionary expectations of the preamble to the UN Charter and the operational provisions of the UN Charter as an international treaty. And there really are two different kinds of documents. The preamble really looks toward what the UN should be if its ideals were to, of war prevention were given primacy. The constitutional document of the Charter really incorporates a militarist geopolitics into the structure of the UN. And so there's always been a kind of unspoken tension between these two conceptions of what the UN is really about. Right. Um, I, I want to come back also to Hans on the issue of sanctions, because obviously um, sanctions is something that you have direct and agonizing first-hand experience of from your role as UN um, humanitarian coordinator in um, Iraq in the 1990s, from which you resigned um, because of your, your 
view of, of the punitive way that the US was, was uh, pushing that, that system. What can we do now to um, end the sanctions that we see against um, not just Cuba, Venezuela, um, Syria, Iran, and so many other countries? Well, you know, it continues to reflect uh, the unilateral decision-making of the UN Security Council. Uh, there are plenty of, uh, of proposals. Uh, Mr. Kofi Annan talked about, for example, never to use the blunt instrument of comprehensive economic sanctions any longer. Well, uh, smart sanctions was supposed to be uh, the, the progress. Uh, Iran shows that there is nothing smart about it unless you look at it from a narrow American Washington perspective, uh, then it is smart. No, it's not smart. It's, it's uh, unfair. It runs counter to all the uh, human rights uh, discussions uh, and conclusions we have had. Um, I, I, I think we will, we will continue to struggle with this deep gap between those, for example, in the General Assembly that want to end the sanctions against uh, Cuba. They want to see a return to the five plus one Iran debate uh, and end the sanctions on Iran. Um, and yet they are not strong enough to make a difference. Um, the difference is still there where the, power, the military power is and unfortunately, despite what I said about the, uh, the, the very small contributions in financial terms to the, uh, to the UN budget, uh, also the financial stick is still strong because the, 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 the American government pays 22% of the um, UN budget. But let me footnote here, the, this 22% would be higher if America is the only country that is not measured according to the same key that the others are measured. Because if they were measured like the other 192 countries, America would have to pay more than 22%. You know, so there is the power of the money, there is the military uh, power and there's something else. Maybe uh, we haven't uh, thought about that enough and that is the penholder advantage. The, the fact that you have in the Security Council today five countries that have from the first day of the existence of the UN until today uh, been party to the debates. They have an enormous advantage over decision making because they know every trick there is to to, to have to make, to, to win the battle, the political battle on a national or regional basis. So the, the, the gap between a well-meaning, and I, I know what I'm saying, well-meaning General Assembly and a hardcore um, national power-oriented Security Council is there. And that, that needs to become victim of uh, of a reform debate, which at the moment, unfortunately, is very difficult to have given the overall uh, geopolitical climate uh, that we, we, we have. Richard, uh, do you have anything to add on this question of, of um, sanctions? Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what both of you have said. I think the uh, problem is not only a legal problem of the veto and of the kind of authority that uh, the U.S. has wielded. It's also a failure of uh, an unenlightened uh, foreign policy and world outlook that has dominated Washington ever since the Cold War. And, the, and it's a bipartisan consensus. And in this sense, I'm rather pessimistic about what alternatives will come even if a new leadership under the Democratic Party emerges. If you look at the adv foreign policy advisors that Biden has selected, they all represent continuations of a militarist geopolitics and a neoliberal uh, approach to globalization. Both of those are 
uh, death warrants for the world order system we're living in. I, I think that's sadly true if you look at uh, Biden, the people that Biden is currently listening to. Of course, we, we hope that there is um, the possibility of building up the progressive movement in this country um, much stronger than it is already. And it's, you know, it, we've already seen some new things happening with the Black Lives Matter movement and the degree to which it has gotten wonderful support from you know, multi-generational groups of people, multi-racial groups of people, the people out on the streets are really quite inspiring in most cases, little bit of violence, but a lot of mass um, multi-racial multi -racial activity going on. And to me, the, the, um, one of the challenges is to, make, to try to link these people's struggles for, um, equality and justice and accountability here in the United States with the struggles of people in the global south where the the need is even greater and the, the crisis is even more um, dire. So if either of you has um, some advice for how we can make these links, that would be really helpful. I, I would say that the links Link, a link comes when people find each other. And uh, people in the US, so many well-meaning people uh, whom the world needs, need to find the others. And therefore, it is in a way tragic that the World Social Forum that uh, used to have a prominent role is now limping. Uh, we need to reinvigorate these global initiatives uh, support them. The public must ex must show that they are that they see value in this, and that is cross national. This is global. We need a global cri de coeur, a global outcry. Uh, given the situation, we don't need. It's not about money. It is not about. Money. It is about uh, the fact that our <laughs> our minds must begin to. Uh, to be linked uh, to our hearts uh, and we must try and find um, a much greater um, courage to, uh, to show the other side, to show the world in whatever forum there is and uh, there are good initiatives. There is for example now a link between uh, individual members of the Security Council and civil society. That needs to be intensified, uh, enlarged, so that the voices of America join the voices from other parts of the world to try to bring this incredibly powerful and valuable um, instrument called the United Nations into a situation where it can function as it was meant to function. That's what I would like to Thank answer. You. Yeah, Richard, um, do you have a, a thought about how to connect with uh, struggles internationally? Well, I think it, it, there's a need for a movement, uh, a movement internationally and transnationally that steps outside these uh, formal corridors of authority and power. Because even though, as you point out, lots is happening in the streets of America, but I'm not sure it's happening in the halls of Congress or <laughs> in the institutions of America. And the, the challenge for the, for the, uh, to, to establish the link to the global south is first you have to get some degree of responsible participation by these dominant states in the world system. And that involves what uh, Hans has been saying, not only military uh, uh, self-restraint, but also financial uh, responsibility, ecological responsibility, and uh, diplomatic understanding that we're in this together and if we don't act cooperatively and the UN is the best instrument we have for doing that, we face a future that is very bleak. I think that's a, a great note for us to end this portion.
question on Richard because it takes us right back to the first webinar that you were part of when you talked about how this pandemic has revealed everybody's shared vulnerability around the world. So that's a, a good thought for us to now shift to the Q&A portion here. And for this, I'm going to call on my colleague Charlotte Cates, who will host the Q&A um, period. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you so much, Helena, and thank you to Hans and Richard for a deeply engaging conversation. I do want to let people know that the video as well as the transcript of this conversation will be available on the Just World Educational website at the resources page indicated by Helena earlier in the program um, before this weekend. So all of the uh, detailed discussion that we've had today will be available for your use in the future. Now the first question we have is from Turki Alfesal, who says, the UN Security Council veto system needs to be reformed. Once a resolution is adopted, implementing it should not be vetoed. As an example, um, we see UN Security Council resolutions 242 and 338. There has not been a meaningful implementation in addition to all of the resolutions that have not been passed and that the, the power of the US veto is at the core of this problem. What do you think about the veto system in the Security Council and the kind of reforms that may be possible? Well, if I, I don't know, uh, can I start? Yes, please do. I, this is a question for both of you and your, your insights would be very much welcome. I, I, just, uh, I just think um, that the reform debate is quite advanced for the Security Council. There are, for example, there is a proposal to eliminate the veto. There's another proposal to have a two-thirds majority of voting. Um, the, 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 the misuse of the veto uh, for national, per individual countries' interests has to stop through a redefinition of the veto. When can a veto be cast? That's the first step so that uh, countries don't push their own national envelope, uh, even if the other 14 members of the Security Council think differently. So there are, there are on the table, several Secretary Generals have put on the table good proposals for UN reforms. What is needed now is the political will to look at these seriously again and try to f take decisions. There hasn't been, it's as if the Security Council is in the icebox right now. There is, there is, there, there is no decision-making capacity at this moment. That has to change. Uh, we don't have to come up with a fantastically larger range of proposals that are sleeping already for quite a few years in the Dark Hammershirt Library in New York. They exist. Mm -hmm. So let's unearth them, let's look at them, and then have a debate on implementation. Implementation. And maybe one more sentence, one more word I want to introduce here, uh, the word accountability. We cannot continue to have um, an international body like the UN without any accountability. So when a veto is passed, the demand now is increasingly made, you must justify. And number two, the Secretary General has a responsibility to comment on the decision to cast a veto. Uh, so there is that a process uh, that hopefully will translate into finally um, a change in the way the veto is used and there is more to it. There is, uh, of course, the question, but I will not go into, that's not fair to take too much time, but the whole issue of geographical representation in the Security Council. There are two continents that are not represented at all in the Security Council, That's Afri as far as permanent members are concerned. Africa, 54 countries, 1 billion people has not a seat as a permanent member. Latin America has no seat as a permanent. That all has to change. And when that happens, maybe then uh, it will be uh, a different uh, process altogether uh, when it comes to casting or deciding on, on a veto. I would just add a few words that uh, the, the issue is not imagining how to reform the Security Council or what are the best procedures of curtailing or ending the veto. 
It, it's a matter of how you get the political will in these five countries to uh, overcome their capacity to veto reform proposals. See, in other words, there's a, a sense that this authority that was given to them in the original charter is something that if they relinquish, they weaken their overall international status. And so there's a resistance, at least at the level of government and often at the level of public opinion, in not uh, weakening a particular permanent member's uh, voice and leverage within the UN structure. And it uh, really depends on uh, these five countries accepting the discipline of accountability to which Hans referred. And how you get that to be done is not an easy question given the political consciousness that still prevails in uh, at least Russia, China, and the US, and probably to a great extent in the UK and France as well. Thank you very much. Um, the next question that we have is from uh, Martha Schmidt, who is a long-term human rights attorney. And she notes that Article 24 requires the members of the Security Council to act in accord with the UN principles and purposes, which includes respect for international law. She asks, isn't the problem more one of impunity and a domestic failure of the citizenry of the permanent members to demand their governments respect international law? And uh, Hans or Richard, either one of you, would you like to take this? Richard, do you want to? Uh, okay, I can say a few words. Um, uh, yes, uh, it, it is a um, complete failure of the citizenry to be mobilized around these issues. And as long as that's the case, uh, Article 24 is really a dead letter. And the uh, governments and the US government above all others is uh, regards its role in the Security Council and the UN as one of pushing its national interests and its geopolitical vision. And it really rejects the notion of accountability to international law as a guiding principle for its behavior. And that's true for Republican uh, leadership, and it's true, unfortunately, for Democratic Party leadership, although it's a little bit more disguised when a Democratic president is in the White House. I, I guess I'd like to just jump in here a moment as well, because this is something that I've thought a lot about. Um, you could say that the structure of the veto system right now is at a global level a, a really strong example of white, white privilege. Um, you know, you've got the United States, Russia, England, and France. So England and France were um, historical colonial powers. The United States and to a certain extent Russia are, well, Russia we can leave aside for now, but the United States is a, is a European settler colonial creation. And Russia is another white European power that engaged in a certain amount of, of settler colonialism over there in the East. So China is in, in essence the only representative of the global South. Um, on, on, in the veto structure, and, and we as white Americans, well, I'm a white American, Richard is a white American, Charlotte is, I don't know, are you American or Canadian, whatever. Um, you know, we're very aware of the role of white privilege domestically and the need to combat it. Why don't we do that at the global level? That's just a question I put out there. <laughs> Well, isn't that, isn't that what you're saying, um, a, an encouragement to make sure that we have 
a security council that reflects more geopolitical reality than is the case at the moment. You know, Africa has to be there. Latin America has to be there. More of Asia has to be in the Security Council. And when you get this balance, uh, then you, you, you are maybe achieving what you had in mind with uh, talking about this imbalance that exists at the moment with too many white faces sitting in the, in the Security Council. I think it, it's, I, 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 if we want a UN that functions, uh, there is no other way but to create this this kind of a, an enlargement. One can talk about how big that should be, but it has that it has to come if we want a United Nations, a political United Nations. Then it's it's clear that that's the way we we have to to look at it. You know, the status quo is no longer acceptable, and uh, governments. Uh, and people also, increasingly informed people, will not accept this kind of United Nations decision-making process any longer. It cannot be, it cannot be, and this is again uh, part of what I'm researching at the moment, that year after year after year, the same resolutions are being passed almost verbatim, and nothing happens because there is one country that obstructs what others want. So broaden, broaden the composition, and that's a step in the right direction. Thank you again for these answers and this insightful conversation. I'm just going to turn it back over now to Just World Educational President Helena Coban for some concluding thoughts. And I'm sorry for all of the questions we weren't able to address um, in our limited time available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, this has been a really important and thought-provoking conversation. And I'm particularly sad to bring it to an end because this whole webinar series has been so stimulating, informative, and engaging for me to pull together. But this is only the end of this portion of our project, not the whole of the uh, World After COVID project. So stay tuned for news of our fall plans and go back to our resource center there. You know, everything that we do here um, costs money. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, leave it at that. Um, we do what we can on a shoestring budget, but we'd love to have your support. If any of you watching today are able to, uh, to donate to Just World Educational, go to our website, www.justworldeducational.org, uh, where you'll find a donate button. And we really appreciate everybody who has been giving throughout this whole project. Um, first of all, Hans, I want to turn to you and say what a real honor and pleasure it has been to have you on today's webinar. Thank you very much for saying that. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And um, now Richard. So it was, it was uh, Richard um, who had, I had several conversations with him um, back in early June and they inspired and then launched this whole project. So um, starting off from his earlier webinar appearance with the recognition that he gave there of the fact of the deep vulnerability that all human beings currently share. So Richard, thank you for launching us. Thank, thanks, thank you for being here with us in June and thank you for being with us here today. It's been my stimulating pleasure. Thank you for arranging and managing it so well. <laughs> so, um, Finally, I want to remind people that we um, welcome your evaluations of both today's webinar and the whole series. I don't know how many um, any of you have actually had the chance to take part in. I know some people have been with us for all eight so far, which is great. Um, so as you leave today's webinar, I hope I've got the thing set up right. Um, you should be sent straight to the, uh, to the evaluation form. If you could fill that out, that would really help us going forward. So now I want to thank Charlotte Cates, who's been my comrade in arms in, in planning all of this. Charlotte, it's been just a pleasure to have you. And of course, we are expecting and hoping that you will st stick with the project wherever it takes us in the fall. 
And now I just want to thank all of you, the attendees at this webinar. Thanks for coming with us on this journey of reflection. Um, tell your friends about our resource center. Send in your suggestions in the evaluations. See you in the fall and have a great and safe August. Goodbye. Nice. Very nice. <clears throat>